call us to order. I call this meeting of the Shirt Sibyl Universal City Independent School District to order. Let the record show that a quorum of board members <coughs> is present, that this meeting has been duly call called, and that notice of this meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551. The time is 6.01. Priscilla, roll call. All board members are present except for Mr. Finley. Mr. Finley is feeling under the weather, and we hope that he gets to feeling better. Um, we're going to start off with our pledges. Tonight, we're honored to have Liam Hepburn, a third grader at Watts Elementary, and his principal, Ms. Jackson, is going to introduce him. Good evening, members of the board, President Dreisbeck and Superintendent Dr. Gibson. I am Deanna Jackson, principal at Watts Elementary. I would like to introduce to you Liam Hepburn. He is a third grader at Watts Elementary. Liam was selected to be recognized this evening because he is considered to be very polite, responsible, and quite inquisitive, especially in science. He cares deeply about others and shows this in his actions and words. His favorite subject is math, and he enjoys reading books about action and adventure, and he says he plays video games every now and then. He's joined this evening by his mom, Ms. Hepburn, and his grandmother, Ms. Zinn. We please stand to be recognized. At this time, Liam will be leading us in our pledges this evening. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and, and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Liam. I want to welcome all of you here today. I see we have a full crowd. Um, as we start off our board meetings, our first one for the year 2020, halfway through the school year, um, it's somewhat sad tonight as well because this is Dr. Gibson's last board meeting that he will be over. Um, so we've had a wonderful 10 years with Dr. Gibson. I met him as a parent probably, gosh, six, nine seven, years nine years ago, <laughs> uh, and then have served um, on the board with him for um, four, about almost four and a half years. And so um, I see Mr. Ricks in the audience. He was one of the board members that um, came um, that helped bring Dr. Gibson here. And we have a few others on the board that are with us, um, Mr. Inman and Mr. Pivoteau that brought him here 10 years ago. And what a great service he's done for our district. We're going to miss him um, truly. And we're going to invite all of you in March. Um, we'll have it posted. We're going to have a reception, a come and go for Dr. Gibson. And we encourage all of you to come and wish him farewell in his retirement. So let me, I'll, so that we can just get this over with. Okay, right up front. Um, Ten years ago, I made uh, was trying to decide we were going to consider a move. Our kid, older, younger two were going into high school, so we were, I just told Otika if we're going to, you know, change, you know, now is the time to do it before our kids go into high school. So I said, just pick, you know, pick an area. So she, uh, look, this was actually open, and New Braunfels was open. Some Mr. Ricks probably remembers that Mr. Pivot and Mr. Inman, and. Uh, Tate overheard us, my middle child, and said, you need to go to one of those two because Slitterbon and Fiesta Texas are right down the road. Um, we didn't choose it for that reason, um, um, but I can tell you that I, if I ever had any doubt in my mind, when I met George Ricks and when I met Scott Herod, that doubt was gone. And I knew it was the right fit for my family. And I want to thank you, not just as a superintendent for the opportunity to work here, but as a father who y'all helped me raise uh, two kids uh, the other one was already through, uh, had graduated when we came here. And then I'll just, I'll tell you um, what I told the principals today that um, I was trying to find some profound quote, you know, to wrap things up and I couldn't find, prof well, maybe it is profound, but it's Winnie the Pooh, so <laughs> the elementary. But Winnie the Pooh said, uh, think about how lucky I am to have had something so special that I'm sad to see it go. 
And, you know, I was just going through my list. And when I saw that, I thought, OK, it's Winnie the Pooh. Winnie the Pooh is going to be my quote. So I am I, I, and I believe in that, that, if you know, if I'm sad, it's because I was lucky enough to have been here in the first place. So thank you all for everything that you've done for me and my family. And this is my 452nd board meeting. And this is where I draw the line. So <laughs> Not, I'm not uh, this is the last one, but thank you all for everything that you've done and thank you for being here, Mr. Ritz. Okay, now that that's said, we still know Otika would yeah. tell him quite often, don't mess it up. <laughs> You are correct, so I'm not going to deny it. <laughs> okay, on to our Vice President's recitation of the District Mission, Vision, Values, and Priorities. There we all are. Our motto at SEUC, a district with passion and purpose. Mission, SEUC ISD, a diverse community founded in trust and transparency, commits to empower all students to fulfill lifelong potential through inspiring learning experiences. Vision is in inspire, innovate, excel. Values are leadership, character, commitment, service, and learning. And we have four priorities. All graduates will be college and or career and or military ready, high performing and engaged workforce, highly satisfied students, parents and community, efficient district and campus operations. Now we'll have the board recitation of the district belief statements. We believe all students have the capacity to learn and excel. We believe a safe, secure and supportive environment is paramount to learning. We believe in living our core values of leadership, character, commitment, service, and learning. And we believe engaging, interactive, and authentic teaching creates empowered, inspired learners prepared for our changing world. We believe technology is a relevant tool that enhances learning in and beyond the classroom. We believe in a professional learning community that fosters collaboration for continuous improvement. We believe transparent, clear, and timely communication among all is critical to success. Uh, we believe measures of success go beyond standardized testing, and we believe that public education is defined by the local community with limited state involvement. Now we'll have our vice president's overview of good governance indicators and board member ethics. Tonight I want to read number three on our good governance self-check. I've got these glasses. I'm going to put them down where I can use them. <laughs> the board has a code of ethics for itself and promotes ethical behavior in the governance structure throughout the organization and interac interactions with workforce, vendors, and shareholders. Criteria for consideration, the board has adopted and annually reaffirms an ethics statement or code of conduct for board members. The board receives an annual report regarding code of, con of ethics, development, for staff members in, in the organization. The board has a written process for dealing with breaches of ethical conduct. The board agenda materials and minutes indicate that a code of ethics has been affirmed by all current board members on a regular basis. Thank you. Now Dr. Gibson will recognize the following student representatives for the month of January. Yeah, it's my honor and privilege tonight on my final board meeting to introduce two uh, young ladies well deserving of being our student uh, representatives of the month. So tonight we have Emma Yahimovich, 11th grader from Clemens High School, easy for me to say, and Rosalia Flores, a 12th grader from Steele High School, and I think Ms. Zirazadi and Ms. Bandy are here to introduce them, and ladies, if you would, just you can go around and meet your uh, principals at the podium. And welcome, and let's go ahead and give them a round of applause for being Thank you. 
It is an absolute joy to introduce this phenomenal young woman, Emma Yahimovic. Currently, Emma is an 11th grader at Clemens High School. She has an 105.3 average while taking AP English, AP U.S. History, and Honors Pre-Calculus classes. She is here this evening representing our Texas Association of Future Educators, or TAFI organization, as the current historian and outstanding member and leader of two years. As a TAFI member, she qualified for both for state both years and qualified last year for nationals. Emma is the daughter of Jody and Eric Yahimovich, who are in attendance this evening. If you would please stand. Hey, Mom. Hey, Mom. Miss Wendy Frisbee sponsors Taffy and is here as well supporting Emma. Miss Frisbee, would you please stand? <laughs> Emma is also well known as a super fan to all Clemens extracurricular groups with her entertaining musical stylings and performances at Prep Arlies and on Twitter. We are very proud of the spark she brings to everyone she encounters inside and outside of the Clemens community. It is my honor to introduce Miss Emma Yahimovic. Good evening, Dr. Gibson, President Dreisbeck, and members of the board. Thank you for inviting me to speak tonight. My name is Emma Yahimovic, and I am a junior at Samuel Clemens High School. I'm an AP student and, like Ms. Sirizotti said, the biggest Buffalo Athletics fan around. When I'm not studying, I'm most certainly painting my face for a Friday night football game or announcing for the volleyball team. My plans for the future involve not only starting my own business and becoming an author, but also becoming a teacher and changing the world one little heart at a time. In my years at Clemens, I have been given the opportunity to join groups and clubs centered around my interests. During my freshman year, I participated in the Family, Career, and Community Leaders of America's Club, FCCLA for short, in which my team and I taught a lesson on nutrition to elementary students. We presented this lesson to judges during the competition and ended up placing third at the state level. I joined the Texas Association of Future Educators Club at Clemens my sophomore year after hearing about it through friends. Taffy allowed me to meet my peers who have spe the specific goal of becoming teachers. My first year, I competed at the regional and state levels for Taffy in two events. I took the Educational Leaders Fundamentals Test, which quizzes the basics of being an educator and its ethics. My scores on the test took me to the state level competition. My other event was called Educators Rising Moment, in which I gave a speech to a panel of judges on why I want to be a teacher. The speech, in which I discussed one special girl I had the honor to mentor in junior high, qualified me to compete at the national level after placing in the top five at state. This year, I again took the Educational Leaders Fundamentals Test and qualified for the state competition. Taffy, along with Ready, Set, Teach, where I teach at Pasco Elementary, go Patriots, <laughs> has given me the opportunity to experience an educator's lifestyle firsthand and bear witness to all the influence a teacher has on a student. Clubs like Taffy allow students like me to dive deeper into their interests and experience work-like situations before we have to make big life decisions like college. I'm also a member of the DECA club at Clemens, which focuses primarily on business and entrepreneurship. One thing I admire about the clubs and groups at Clemens is their cohesiveness. I, with the help of my partner, was able to take my love of teaching and turn it into a DECA presentation to compete with. DECA has awakened my love for all things business and being my own boss. We will compete at the state level for DECA next month. Also, as a member of the National Honor Society, I enjoy serving my school and community. I'm honored to have been selected for NHS and I'm grateful for the connections and leadership skills it has granted me. Besides molding little hearts and becoming the new, next New York Times bestseller, I am most proud of being an officer in the Fellowship of Christian Athletes Club. FCA at Clemens is raising world-changing leaders who will impact the world for Jesus Christ. The freedom and ability to have such a club at school is something I am grateful for and do not take lightly. I'm so thankful to the district for giving me and many others the opportunity to participate in clubs such as these, which help make us future ready. The impact such programs have had on me is lasting, and I am grateful for the experiences I have been given through them. Thank you.
Good evening, Dr. Gibson, President Dreisbach, and distinguished members of the board. At this time, I'd like to introduce an extraordinary young lady and future leader who proudly exhibits all the traits of an SCUC graduate at Steele High School on a daily basis, Ms. Rosalia Flores. Rosalia is accompanied today by her mother, Lorena, and her sponsor, Ms. Mahoney. Rosalie is currently a senior that has been in our district since elementary school in 2008. She wants to thank Wiederstein, Jordan, and Doby for helping to support the skills she exhibits today as an active member of our FCCLA and Ready, Set, Teach programs. Rosie's currently serving as FCCLA Region 5 Vice President of Projects. She's also employed part-time while maintaining A's and B's. She truly appreciates the great qualities she's learned from balancing a job with all her other duties. This is Rosalia's second year participating in the Practicum of Education course, also known as Ready, Set, Teach. She's currently assisting in teaching a kinder and fourth grade class at Cibolo Valley Elementary. During the day she goes off campus to see her classes, she plays an active role in the lives of students, instructing, evaluating, and enhancing all of their learning environment. She believes no student should come to school dreading being there, so she does her best to make sure their time together is enjoyable. She plans to soon attend Kilgore Junior College to earn an associate's in early childhood education. She'll then transfer to a university to gain her teaching certification, hoping to return to the field to teach second grade or high school. And we will gladly give her a strong recommendation one day to return to the teaching profession. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce to you Ms. Rosalia Flores. Hey, Rosalia, does your mom want to come over here to film you? Tell her. He, he's filming. He's got it. Okay. <laughs> all right. Got it under control. All right. <laughs> all right. Um, good evening, Dr. Gibson and President Dry is back. Correct? Okay, good. Um, and members of the board. My name is Rosalia Flores. I'm a senior at uh, Steel High School, a second year practicum education student, and the Region 5. Vice President Projects for SCCLA. I'm here representing Practicum and Education Program. This program allows for the opportunity of juniors and seniors to go off campus for elementary schools in our districts for two periods, four days a week, and assist in the classroom of elementary school. This class is truly rewarding for the hearts of people who want to gain an experience in teaching. The course gives high school students a chance to determine if teaching is the right career choice for them. In the practice of education course has built me to be a leader in more than one facet of my life. My first year, I had the opportunity to teach in the same classroom as my second grade teachers, Ms. Evans and Ms. Webb. Um, the opportunity to teach in their class taught me about having patience and responsibility. Patience is a big one. <laughs> Um, my second year, I had the chance to work with both kindergarten and fourth classes simultaneously. So for Monday, Tuesday, I work with my fourth graders. Wednesday, Thursday, I'm with my kindergartners. The experience of working with two sets of learners who have very different needs has taught me to be adaptable in the way I teach and more knowledge about teaching techniques. But not only is it a class to connect and help children, it's a class where we learn the importance of lesson plans in the success of our students. Being a part of this program has helped me to take more initiative in my personal life. Having students who depend on me and expect me to be accountable has inspired me to, be to take on responsibilities outside of the classroom, as well as touch the minds of our future students. Thank you. Thank you. 
I wish they would have had RST at my high school, ready, set, teach, yeah. because I think it, first of all, my mom would have loved it as a teacher to have somebody come into her classroom two hours a day, and I would have loved to have spent two hours a day in somebody's classroom, my own daughter's in ready, set, teach, so I'm so glad that we can promote that. Um, next on our agenda, Dr. Gibson, school board recognition. Yeah, and I was actually going to say the thing I said earlier in school board recognition, so we're past that. So thank you for the opportunity to do that. But each uh, January, <clears throat> Texas Association of School Board encourages um, school districts to recognize their trustees. It's a purely volunteer, volunteer role. Uh, the pay, just to be clear to everyone, is zero for what these people do and all the additional reading and work and training. And I mean, it's, it's truly unbelievable and remarkable how much work they go through for basically a volunteer position. Now, having said that, we're gonna follow our tradition tonight. Dede and I, were, we think it started seven or eight years ago, and it's a really good tradition. It's one you might put on your list to continue. Um, <laughs> but we dedicate a library book in each school's library with an insert in honor of a trustee that's here. And then in addition to that, <clears throat> we have our district uh, challenge coins with this being a military community. Many of you are familiar with that. But what you may not know is that our core values are leadership, character, commitment, service, and learning. And I have a service coin, which is a gold coin. And I'm going to give each trustee a service coin for their service to SCUC ISD. Uh, yep. And, um, you know, you need another one? The, yeah, that's right. We have someone absent. Um, and that is, you know, the coin is worth whatever we get on low bid, I'm sure. But just know that it's, it's really the concept of service because service is that you're serving something better than yourself or bigger than yourself. And that's what these trustees do. Now, having said that, we're going to do as many photo ops as we can get with as many great kids. And we're going to do it right up here. So trustees, if you'll line up over there, kids are lined up over there and I'll meet y'all right down front. All right. Well, first campus is Cibolo Valley, Principal Rhonda Young-Michael. Our student this evening is Reagan Lee, who is a fourth grader. Their uh, library book will be donated to board member Robert Westbrook. Book title, She Persisted. Next is Green Valley Elementary, Principal Amy Denman. Our student this evening is Isabella McDaniel Lopez. She is a fourth grade student. Their library book will be donated to Mr. Ed Finley. Thank you. 
Next is Pascal Elementary, Principal Allison Miller. Student is Eddie Ryan, who is a fourth grader at Pascal, and their library book is being donated uh, to our board member, Gary Inman. Next is Watts Elementary, Principal Deanna Jackson. Our student this evening is Liam Hepburn, third grade student, and the board member library book will be donated to Amy Dreisbeck. Next is Wiederstein Elementary, Principal Mr. Luis Chavez. Student is Robin Nelson, who is a third grader. Their library book will be donated to Ed Finley. <laughs> Next is Rose Garden Elementary, Principal Cindy Ward. Student this evening is Brooklyn Heath, who is a fourth grader. The library book will be donate, donated to our board member, Leticia Seaver. <laughs> Shirts Elementary is next. Principal Jerry Pope, student Melody Miller, fourth grade student. And the board member being dedicated this evening is Gerald Perkins. Our last elementary school is Sipple Elementary. Principal Clary Bristow. Student is True Williams, fourth grader. And our board member being dedicated tonight is David Pivato. Next is our intermediate schools. We have Jordan Intermediate, Principal Tina Curtis. Student being recognized or going to be recognizing our board member is Stason Taylor, who is a sixth grader. And their board member is Amy Dreisbeck. <laughs> Next, we have Wilder Intermediate, Principal Sarah Dolphine. Student is Davis Reifenberg, who is a sixth grader. And the board member that's being dedicated, um, this book that's being dedicated is David Pivato. And our last intermediate, Schlother Intermediate. Principal, Yvette Ross. Our student is Bailey Painter, who is a sixth grader. And the board member library book that's being dedicated to is Gerald Perkins. All right, our secondary schools. We're gonna start off with Doby Junior High. Principal Vernon Simmons is accompanied by Sydney Morris in eighth grade. Gonna be uh, dominating this library book in the name of Mr. Robert Westbrook. All right, next up is Corbett Junior High, being represented by Miss Renee Altamirano. She's accompanying Lauren Parker, a seventh grader, and they are dominating their library book in the name of Mr. David Pivato. Okay, next up is Allison Steele Enhanced Learning Center. Dr. Lisa Newman is the principal accompanying Zai Trumps. She is a 12th grader and they are donating their library book in the name of Miss Leticia Seaver. <laughs> All 
All right, next up, Byron Steele High School. Principal Janice Cervantes is accompanying our very own Rosalia Flores. You just heard from her. She's a senior at Brook at uh, Byron Steele, donating their library book in the name of Mr. Ed Finley. Okay, next is Clemens High School, being represented by Miss Amy Sirazadi. She's accompanying our very own Emma Yahimovich. She is an 11th grader, and they are donating their library book in the name of Miss Letitia Seaver. Okay, next up, our 18 plus program is being represented by Miss Adriana White and Miss. And Daria Whalen, they are accompanying Dante Davis and Bridget Thomas. 18 Plus is donating their library book in the name of Miss Amy Dreisbeck. All right, and our final library book tonight is being uh, presented by Miss Stacy Cerner from DAEP to Mr. Gary Inman. Sorry, Didi. <laughs> A little bit more. Yes, that that would. A little bit more. <laughs> Put some more in the front. On this side too. Yes. <laughs> Here we go. Ready? When you're ready. Okay, ready? Next on the agenda is recognition of our principal representatives for the month of January by Dr. Limley and Ms. Goldhorn.
<laughs> Next on the agenda is recognition of the principles of the month. <laughs> I, heard our I was using my teacher voice. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good evening, members of the board, President Drysback and Superintendent Dr. Gibson. As Director of Elementary Education, I would like to introduce to you our elementary principal who is attending this month's board meeting. Deanna Jackson is the principal at Watts Elementary, and she has been in education for 16 years and 10 years in SCUC. A fun fact about Deanna is she is a boy mom who loves all things football and basketball. Her youngest is almost four years old and loves football already. And her oldest is playing in his first junior high basketball game at Dobie on Thursday night. Aww. Deanna Jackson. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> oh, you just wait. You'll probably have one. <laughs> you got too many boys. No wrestling. <laughs> I know. Okay. Are we staying? Good evening, members of the board. Yep. President Drysback and Superintendent Dr. Gibson, I would like to introduce to you the secondary principal who is attending this month's board meeting. Dr. Lisa Newman is the principal at Allison Steele Enhanced Learning Center. She has served in education for 30 years, 12 of which has been right here in SCUC. A fun fact about Lisa is that she spent a year living in just outside of Edinburgh, Scotland. The name wow. and the address of her house was Faye Me Well House. There really <laughs> were live bats in the belfry that were protected by law. Wow. Dr. Lisa Newman. Wow. In fact, I didn't know. I like having that fun fact. That is interesting. Oh, we have to go check this. Oh, my Thank you, principals. Next, we have public comments. Now the Board of Trustees will hear public comments per House Bill number 2840 passed by the Texas Legislature during the 86th Texas Legislative Session. The Board of Trustees has modified the district's format for hearing public comments. This new format is the district's best good faith effort to ensure compliance with House Bill 2840 as we await further clarification from TASB Policy Service regarding legal and law local policy revisions. The public comment portion of the meeting will now consist of two sections, one for public comments on a general topic and the other for public comments pertaining to a specific item posted on the agenda notice for this meeting. In order to provide consistency and fairness to all individuals, public comments will be heard in accordance with current board policy BED local and procedures outlined in current administrative regulation BED. Comments should be limited to topics such as policies, curriculum, and facilities. Any direct criticism of criticism of a specific employee will not be heard during public comments and should be considered separately as provided in board policy. In this context, individuals are cautioned not to identify any employee by name or by any combination of words or descriptions which could identify the employee to another individual. Public comments will be limited to individuals who signed up to to participate in the public comment portion of the meeting before the board meeting was called to order. An individual who signs up to participate in the public comment portion of the meeting may not relinquish their time to another individual. No public comment shall exceed three minutes. To ensure compliance with time limitations, a yellow card will be held up by the board secretary. 
assistant at two minutes and a red card will be held up at three minutes. If you would have an issue you'd like to discuss with administrative staff member, complete the designated form located on the table at the back of the room in place and give to us. Um, our first public comment is by Jacqueline Phillips Ott. And that's the only one. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Jacqueline Phillips Ott, and I am coming before you to introduce myself to you and talk a little bit about what I believe are some common goals of yourselves and myself. I am a prosecutor in Guadalupe County. I came over when we were in the district attorney's office, and we're now the county attorney's office, but it is the same thing. We still operate under felony and misdemeanor cases and some civil prosecution. I am running for district judge of the 25th Judicial District, which covers all of Guadalupe County, which is in the March primary. I have an extensive background in several different categories. I initially was working gang and narcotics when I got out of law school in Houston, in the Fort Bend area. After that, I was in a civil practice um, with various things that included oil and gas, family law, juvenile law, juvenile mental health, different custody arrangement issues, and I was also an amicus and ad litem in CPS cases, assisting both um, forensic interviewers, CPS, and law enforcement in cases where children were endangered. After that, I went and I ran the CPS unit in Comal County, which is a lot of the same things, but on the government and prosecution side. When we had CPS cases, both in schools, foster homes, and et cetera, I would go out with CPS investigators and assist them in doing proper investigations so that we could make sure our children are safe. I ended up in Guadalupe County, uh, first of all, because my husband is part of a sixth generation family of Guadalupe County, so we are here to stay and very happy about it. But I also came to Guadalupe County because they began a program that was family justice centered around children and child safety. What that was is they wanted someone to head it, which was myself at the time, who had both criminal and civil experience in both the prosecution side and the private sector to come and make sure that the information sharing and transfer was fluid between the state government, which is CPS, housed under their own category, and then county by county. So I do do on-call and did do on-call for several years for a variety of counties. I sit on a statewide board advising um, child safety, both in the prosecutorial and private sector. We talk about how we're going to address pieces of legislation that are coming through and how it would be most effective as far as spending um, taxpayer dollars and training our personnel. In addition to that, um, I did do a lot of the felony cases when the child crimes arose to that level. So that's your typical sex trafficking um, drug endangered children, anything that's exposed to gang activity, um, serious physical injury, et cetera. I have a mission and have always had a mission for child safety and education. I think it is absolutely imperative the success of any community. So I'm happy to be in front of you today. It has always been one of my major priorities, will always be one of my major priorities. It is one of the reasons why I'm running because I wanna put that at the forefront of everyone's agenda. I have had a great time coming and helping teach some classes in your ISD through um, friends that are teachers doing courtroom testimony practice and just talking about different job opportunities for kiddos when they graduate so that they kind of know what's in front of them and would love to continue doing that. So I wanted to just introduce myself to you and tell you that those are some things that are very important to me. I know you wouldn't be here if it wasn't important to you as well. I'm gonna leave some of my materials here with my contact information. I have my email, my, fa oh, excuse me. Thank you for having me. Please feel free to reach out at any time and thank you for your time. Good evening. <laughs> Thank you, Jacqueline. There are no other public comments as well? Okay. Next, we have a public hearing on the Texas Academic Performance Report, the taper, presented by Kelly Kovacs. And while the screen's coming down, Ms. Dresbeck and trustees, uh, you know, we kind of switched now to the business of the night. The, um, not that that wasn't important, everything we did with recognition, um, and I'll just, I'll note that we have probably a five minute superintendent's update coming and then probably a relatively short discussion item, but there are nine items on action tonight. You know, each one that's gonna need a little bit of discussion. And so I'm just noting that just as a facilitator, we, when we get to those action items, we usually don't have that many on there, but it, there's just some things that are coming back from previous EPP and then different items that trustees asked to not be on consent agenda, if that makes sense. So we're coming back to those nine here in just a little bit. And student representatives, any point from this point forward, do you have a green light to go study? <laughs> okay. Is this going to be riveting? You're welcome to stay, but you also have a green light to go study. Okay. <laughs> 
Let's give them another round of Thank applause. Thank you, student representatives. Good evening. I'm pleased tonight to be presenting to you the TAPER report, or Texas Academic Performance Report. Um, this is a required report for the board and for the public to give some information about our district. This is the 2018-2019 report, which means that all of the data comes from the class of 2018 or the year 2018-2019. So what you're seeing tonight is actually about six month old data. Um, we've been working with this data for quite some time, but the taper report doesn't officially come out from TEA until December. And so this is our first chance to share with you what's actually in this report. A few things that we're required to um, talk about include our accountability rating, which you've heard before, we are a B for 2019, and our special education <laughs> status is meets requirements for 2019 as well. When we talk about the taper, it is 26 fun-filled pages of information, um, everything from star results to post-secondary readiness to staff and student demographics. So we're going to share some highlights and some areas that we'd like to continue to work on in all three of those main areas tonight, and we'll share some data. There's a lot here, though, and we really encourage everyone who's watching this at home or here tonight to view the taper report in its full um, 26 page glory. And so the, <laughs> there's a link at the very end of this presentation and it's also going to be, it's already actually posted on our district website as well. So you can re review the full taper report at your leisure. Um, so again, our accountability rating for 2019 was a rating of B on the A through F accountability. You can see some other information there as well, including star performance and school progress. We're gonna talk a little bit about some of those in just a moment. We also need to share with you the campus ratings and distinctions. Again, there's quite a few, um, and this is information that has sh been shared at a previous board meeting, but we wanted to make sure that we included it in this report as well. So let's get into a few star results. Again, this information is a little bit old. Um, it's six months old almost for us. So we've been working with this information for quite some time. And along the way, I'll probably share with you some of the things that we've been doing already as a result of this information. But a few highlights from STAR from 2018, 2019 include all grades, all subjects. That's taking all of our third through 10th grade, 11th grade results in all subjects and putting them together. And the, in that, um, when you look at it from that venue or from that aspect, the SEUC results are better than the state in all areas of passing approaches, meets and masters. Another highlight is eighth grade science. That passing rate increased eight percentage points in just one year, so we're very proud of that. And then school progress, which is a measurement of how much our students grow from year to year, um, was high in both fourth and fifth grade math. Our fourth grade scores jumping 4% in one year and fifth grade math jumping 5% in just one year. Some areas that we would like to continue to focus uh, one of them is reading. We've been talking about that for a little while with you guys, including um, just the information that our scores at most grade levels are pretty flat or slightly decreasing over the past three years. That's true for the state as well in many of the grade levels, although they have seen some gains in some grade levels. Fifth grade science is another area of focus for us. It's been decreasing slightly over the past three years. This year is the first year that we fell below the state average in fifth grade science. And um, they've, their scores have been pretty flat. It's just that ours have been decreasing slightly. This is something we've been working on, and it's one of those things that I'd like to highlight that with fifth grade science, we have some changes this year happening since we have this data, and we've known that this has been in place, including instructional minutes for our elementary schools that include 40 minutes of science every day for kindergarten through fourth grade because we know that fifth grade science teachers can't catch up all of the things that um, might have been missed. And um, we also wanna make sure that our um, teachers have all of the curriculum that they need. And that fifth grade science curriculum was written last year. So this is the first year that they've had it in place. So we're hoping to see some gains in that area this coming year, this spring. 
So a few specifics. This is the overall. Remember, we talked about all grades, all subjects. This is a look at that for the last three years. The first three columns, just to orient you, are the state, the region, and the district. That's going to be the same on this slide and the next one. And the district uh, for 1819 is the blue. Or pardon me, for 1819, the one that we're looking at for this past year is blue, pardon me. So you can see the state and region are below the district. That's the highlight that we just mentioned. And then a few specific student groups, uh, African-American, white, Hispanic, and other. And you can see how those continue to stay above the state and region as well. This next one, those first three um, columns are the same, state, region, and district, but a couple of other groups, special education, economically disadvantaged, and English language learners. If you'll remember last year, we had a great jump with our English language learners at 54 to 73, and we were pleased to see that they continued to maintain that higher level of performance. This next slide is really about master's level. So students who reach the master's level, SCUC in 2019, this past year, is in blue, and the state is the gray. So you can see that we're above them in all subjects. Uh, the only one that is not true is writing. Priority one, as you all know, is really about our college and career readiness, as well as um, college, career, and military readiness. And 1.3 specifically is about reading. So we're going to look at our reading scores for grades 3 through 10. You can see at the bottom, uh, just to orient you, third grade on the left all the way to English 2 on the right. And again, SCUC for last year is in blue and the state is in gray. So you can see the trends there. Typically, um, SCUC is above the state in all of those grade levels. You can see, though, that we were talking about how the reading scores are mostly flat. There's not a big increase or a big decrease. We're just sort of there. And we're not making big gains, but we're, not also, we're also not making uh, big losses. But it's something that we're keeping an eye on, for sure. Star writing, as we mentioned, is an area that we're um, needing to focus on. Fourth grade is just above the state 69 to the state 67 percent passing, and seventh grade um, is 74 to 70. That you can see the drop of three percentage points year over year for seventh grade. Star mathematics, I'll give you just a moment to review as well. Again, SCUC is in blue, the state is in gray. And then science, similarly, um, that test is only offered at fifth grade, eighth grade, and biology, so we have less information there. You can see a nice jump in that eighth grade score, which we highlighted for you as well. And then social studies, again, SUC in blue, state in gray. Uh, we're uh, above the state average, as we typically are. Uh, this is eighth grade in U.S. history. The next portion of the taper report that we're going to just highlight a few things is about post-secondary readiness. And there's quite a few highlights. SAT and ACT scores, the average scores for both of those um, tests beat the state and regional averages. Our AP and IB results, which is students making the criterion, which is AP at a three or better and IB at a four or better. Uh, we beat the state averages for English and math. SAT results at or above criterion, which I believe was a combined score of 10-10 this past year, or for the class of 2018, um, SEUC beat the state again, 42.9 to 37.9. And then CTE coherent sequence completion increased by 7.3% over just one year. And you can see we're significantly beating the state average on that by about 20 percentage points. Some areas of focus, APIB results were great in ELA and math. Um, science and social studies fall below the state. Um, in that particular case, by the way, let me look at my notes. Um, that's actually out of all 11th and 12th graders that they had at least one AP or IB test that met the criterion. That's probably a low number because we offer so many uh, dual credit offerings. And then um, industry-based certifications, SCUC is at 2.1% and the state is at 4.8%. Um, those are both low numbers. It's um, primarily because the state just uh, made the list for approved industry-based certifications and they weren't in place for the entire time the class of 2018 was in school. 
So priority one also talks about that college career or military ready. And so we're gonna just take a look at um, what the state defines as college career military readiness and our completion rates. So for the class of 2018, it's in blue. The state for the class of 2018 is in gray and you can see we're just below on that. The criterion for the state includes all of these things. So college ready includes the three on an AP or four on an IB exam. There's some TSI criteria for entering college, SAT and ACT, dual credit, earning and associates, under career ready, they've got a number of things including industry certification, and then military ready. The only one they have listed is enlistment in the United States Armed Forces. With that, our district felt like there might be some additional criterion that would best help us define if students are college, career, or military ready. And so we've added to this list a little bit. And you can see in yellow there, those are the things that we've added, the completion of an endorsement and earning a certification. The state only asks for a certification. We'd like to see them earn an endorsement. And for military ready, we also added if they've taken the ASVAB and scored a 31 or better, or completed junior ROTC, or have been accepted into an ROTC program at the university, we're considering them military ready. And in that case, the class of 2019 was an 81%. A few other um, statistics for you, dual course credit. We mentioned that earlier, that we do have quite a few offerings for dual credit. We had 21.3% of our annual graduates who either earned, earned nine or more credits in anything for dual credit or three or more hours in ELA or math. CTE coherent sequence also um, is in the upper right-hand corner. That's the coherent sequence with the industry-based certification. That's 30.8%. College ready graduates with TSI, either ELIR or MAP, is at 52.5%. The state's at 50%. And then the AP, how many of what percentage of our students had met criteria for AP or IB? That was 20.9%, slightly above the state average of 20.4. We talked about uh, one of our highlights was the SAT average scores. You can see there the district is in blue, the state is in gray, and the region is in green. So you can see we beat. Um, those averages in, on SAT, and we did the same for ACT. Let's see that we've consistently done so over the last three years. Last, we'll talk about staff and student demographics. Uh, a few highlights, our ter teacher turnover rate is much lower than the state, 10.4 to the state 16.5%. And our average years of experience is 12.7 years of experience. The state's actually creeped up a little bit on us for that one, but it's nice to know that we have teachers who have a lot of experience with teaching our students. A couple of areas of focus for the first time in at least five years. Um, we have a little bit of competition for our staff retention percentage. Uh, we've been touting uh, that wonderful number for quite some time, and for the first time this past year, we dropped below one of our neighboring districts. And the number of students per teacher is another one just to keep an eye on. SEUC is at 16.8, and state is at 15.1. Um, another requirement that we need to share with you is the ratio of counselors to students. This is um, a little bit of a difficult number to really share because overall it's one counselor to 544 students, but it's not exactly like that when we're talking about schools because as you know, uh, we have one counselor for each elementary school and some of our elementary schools have more than 544 students. So. It's not exactly uh, 1 to 544, although if you look at the total numbers, that's what it ends up becoming. Um, we'll look over at the teacher turnover rate. You can see consistently we've fallen well below the state. That number's creeping up just slightly uh, over the last three years. Um, this next one is really about our region, and this is where I'll point you to this last um, area over here. This is 2018, 2019, and you can see we were at 10.4%, and for the first time in quite some time, Northside beat us at 9.8% turnover. So we've um, got a little bit of competition there perhaps for that. Our, we are required to share this, not only at this board meeting, however, uh, or, uh, but also at um, all of our campuses. Our principals received a copy of the full taper report to keep in their front offices. Anyone can stop by at any time to take a look at that. It's also posted on our district website as required and um, is linked here if anyone would like to take a look at that as well. 
And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions, if I can. Ms. Kovacs, don't, yes. I don't need for you to go into great detail, but just explain to me a little bit about ASVAP. Yeah, I'm going to probably have to um, di divert that question right over here to Cassandra Gracia, who's okay. in charge of our CCMR. So the ASVAB is the test that the students take uh, if they are interested in going into the military. Now we offer the ASVAB at both high schools um, twice. Uh, they are not required to go into the military. It's a great battery of tests to help them determine um, where their strengths are and their, and their interests. And they have to have a certain score to go into a particular branch. We chose 31 as the number because there are actually three branches they can go into with a 31. Others obviously require a higher score, but that, that's why we chose 31 on the ASVAB. Yes, yes, it, that's exactly what it is. It's, an, it's a battery of apt, uh, aptitude tests uh, for vocational. Other questions? I do have one other okay. question. Uh, I might have missed it because I was looking for it. I tried to review it online, but the uh, dual language proficiency progress, was that presented in your presentation? Um, when, I when I looked at TA on the website, there's um, as part of the taper, it said that some of that information was in the taper. I just didn't know if that was in your presentation or not. It is not in the presentation. I okay. have to look and see. It is in the full report, I believe. That's right. I can look through the, I looked through the taper. It's just, there were a lot of numbers. I just thought, well, I'm not the subject matter expert. So I left that to Dr. Edwards and yourself. I actually think it's the English language learners rather than the dual credit. Did you say English language learners? Sorry. Yeah, there's something about dual language proficiency, proficiency progress. You know what? You can send it in board updates. You don't have to do it now. I it's, will. It's I'll be happy to do that. I, I know that it, um, it's on the results-driven accountability for sure. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if it's listed in here in that way. Okay. So it may be on a different report. Thank you. And so many years we I've sat up here and I'm probably consistent is, do y'all ever have like a lessons learned repository? Like you go back, so what lessons did you learn in 2013, 14, 14, 15, 15, 16 and see if they're repeating themselves or not? or? Right. I mean, well, I've only been here a year and a half, so yes. I can't, I don't know that I can speak to that piece, but I will say that every year when results come out, we spend um, quite a bit of time, not only in the summer um, with our leadership teams, but every leadership team then also works with their campus to take a look at the data and also take a look back and say, what have we been doing? What's working and what's not working? Um, this year, we've really tried to incorporate more, even more um, what are other campuses doing? Those who are performing well, share the, share the wealth. We want to all know what you're doing so that we can try to take pieces of that and use it with our staff and with our students. So I can't speak to several years for, ago, but. <clears throat> well, I would say during, um, as, as Ms. Kovac said, we have several mechanisms to do that, certainly with our principal PLCs. Just today, as a matter of fact, we had one of our principals share out some of the things they're doing on their campus to look at their results and determine their growth uh, and monitoring their student growth. So, yes, there's a, I don't know if we can hand you a manual that says this is how we, this is how we do it all the time, but there's constant sharing with principals. That's part of their work in their, with their, uh, within their CIP. Um, and this last year was part of the significant work with our elementaries with the Effective Schools Framework template that they used. Thank you. Ms. Kovac, <clears throat> do we consider the communities and schools site coordinators on campuses when we're mm -hmm. counting counselors? Would it be, could we argue that that number isn't as bad as it looks? I would probably, again, defer to Cassandra Gracia. They are not included in the 29 okay. number for sure. Oh, thank you. Uh, no, we, we actually don't count them because um, in order to count them, they have to be professional school counselors with certain requirements. So there's a whole list of requirements for them. Because, yeah, so we do not count them. Anybody else? I had one um, question on the high school data 
um, more of the college career readiness. Um, I know y'all went back and looked at 2019s and, you know, gave them some different criteria, but they use on that taper report, that's the criteria they're using for those letter grades for the schools, aren't they? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. So it's not that we ignore what the state has given no. us, certainly. It was just additional information right. for you all. No, no, that's fine. I, I completely understand that, but I, I do know the rigid, the first yes. one way is how they're going to, that's affecting their letter grade for that's each correct. of those high schools. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you very much. At this time, um, we have public comments on the taper Texas Academic Performance Report. Anyone out there want to make a public comment? Please form a line down the middle. <laughs> <of> the <laughs> well, since no one has any comments on that, we'll move on to the superintendent's update by Dr. Gibson. Thank you, President Drasbeck. And just as a note, tonight was priority one and you just heard it. And so I wanted to make a note on the agenda though. So anyone that was wondering, uh, we use the TAPA report as our priority one report. The policy committee had asked for me to keep update 114 on the agenda. And instead of drilling in to the large, the long chart, let me just suffice it to say that we're continuing to work on, you know, the 150 cleanup items related to uh, TASB update 114. Dr. Edwards is going to give a quick update on four of those hundred that probably rise to the top as a little bit bigger chunks of work that we're taking on. So tonight he's going to update us on four items related to HB3 and now TASB update 114. Yep. So and it's really just a, a real quick overview of four different um, pretty significant uh, pieces from House Bill 3 from the, the 86 legislature that we're working on. Um, either because they're going to have a pretty big impact on our district uh, moving forward or because uh, potentially and or because there are some some dates that were due on that. Uh, the first one was part of the House Bill 3, the teacher incentive allotment. And if you remember, uh, this was the allotment that was established um, as additional um, potential funding mechanisms uh, for teachers based upon a rubric of teacher performance as well as uh, student performance. Um, some districts were already involved in this. It actually has four cohorts that you can join. Uh, we have submitted um, a, a, a letter of intent. In order to be considered, you had to do this. It was, it was pretty ironic in working with Ms. Cannon and talking with uh, some of those folks in the HR realm as well as the instruction. At first, a lot of districts were saying, no, we're not going to play. There's just too much into it. Um, I think more have come around and said, you know what, we're going to choose one of the options because if we don't, we won't be able to get a, a part of it. So we have submitted um, a cohort D, which gives us two years to study and look and see how things going. It's also going to give us another opportunity for another legislative session to see if anything changes. So we have submitted our letter of intent. We will use the next two years uh, to look at our data and make some study and as well as get some information, some additional, additional information from the state and from what we're hearing. That is what most districts have chosen to do that weren't already involved in that, in that part of the process. There were some districts that they used as the model. So that was just a quick overview of that. We continue to work uh, collaboratively on that. Uh, the next one is also part of the House Bill 3 was related to the K-3 uh, K through three reading academies. Um, if you'll remember, this was part of it that they put into law that all of our K-3 through three, uh, teachers will have to go through a reading academy. Um, right now it's based upon a a 10-day, uh, 8-hour-a-day uh, format, we will use a, um, uh, um, I'm drawing a blank on it now, the, a blended model approach with the service center uh, being our provider. So they will come out and, and train our teachers. This will probably be a phase-in for us because to try to train that magnitude of teachers, all of our K-3 teachers, as well as the expenses that may occur, we'll use a two- to three-year phase-in uh, for that. Uh, we've begun working and having conversations with our principals at our last two PLCs. Uh, we started having conversations with our elementary principals about what is going to be the most effective way to phase that in um, for our district. Uh, another requirement um, that you know of, are, and, that you'll, and again, we wanted to update because you'll hear more and more about this, is our full day pre-K. That will be another uh, process that will phase in over the next few years. Uh, we are in the process, I know Ms. Goldhorn is working with the service center, and part of the requirement is that we identify 
uh, daycare providers in the area that may could help us with that service. Those are pretty limited is what we're finding now uh, for us as well as across all districts. So don't know how much of an option that's going to be. So we're together in working with finance, HR, um, instruction, uh, and now drilling that down into conversations with principals, we'll start developing what that phase in model would look like. That's going to have a pretty significant price tag to it, because when you think about that, we're going to be adding pre-K teachers and aides, uh, as well as instructional uh, materials and things like that at every campus. Uh, again, just wanted to give you updates. And then the next one has to do with the board required goals. Um, that were established in House Bill 3 with college career military readiness. And this is uh, K-3 through re reading. It's really third grade reading and math uh, performance and growth on the STAR. It encourages, encourages you to look at K-2 through two in those two areas as well, which um, by our scorecard, uh, we've already started that process with goal 1.2. So we're in the process, and I've had conversations with Dr. Ely as well as several of others have about moving forward with this certainly with Dr. Gibson, but um, where we're gonna go as a district, and we're gonna start off with our scorecard, take a look at that and what components in that already align, and then what would we need to modify, what would we need to add in order to bring that back as a recommendation uh, in working with our board to approve those board goals, as well as the plans that go along with that. So uh, we shared with, uh, with uh, Mr. Asbeck and Mr. Perkins um, at our last Friday meeting, and wanted to come in and just kind of share with you guys, here are some Uber things that we're working on that it's on our radar. We're working together as a district, as well as now drilling down into some of those uh, with the campuses. And you'll hear more about this as we move along. But we just wanted to, to put those on your radar and let you know they're on our radar as we move forward. But well, if, if I don't mind, I just make a comment on the uh, full day for pre-K. I know city of San Antonio, the residents are due to vote on that, I guess, in May to sort of, I guess, continue the I guess the tax and assessment for pre-K for SA, that full day pre-K, and I, are you paying attention to that? And I just lessons learned from that whole political process or lessons learned and? We're looking at a variety of, of areas. Mm -hmm. There's uh, There are districts in our area that have added pre-K over the years. We're looking at them asking for input, like how do we determine our numbers? You know, there's, there's certain criteria of students that qualify for that, but based on moving from a half day to a full day, Yes. that number will will increase because obviously parents now have a place to put an instructional setting to put their students for the full day. So we're, we're trying to learn and listen, listen and learn uh, in any way we can, working with the service center, listening to other districts. Um, so yes, sir, we're, we're, we're following those type of things. Are we going to have to battle charter schools on that front? Are they required to do pre, full day pre-K? You know what? I, I'll have to... I'm well, sure. I, I think the way it's hard because some do and some don't, but the, I think districts view it as a tool in the toolbox because if we get them started with this earlier, then we they, they stay, you know. Oh, I agree. And, yeah. I just didn't know if they were... Uh, well, I yes. can only tell you, like Northside ISD, I'll use them as an example. They've made a decision to do this, you know, full. Yes, yes. And that's the reason that they gave, is that we want them to get started with us earlier than anyone else and stay with us. Good deal. Thank you. Yes. And I know some people in the public want to know, well, what schools and all that fun stuff. But as soon as that's determined, yes, um, we will definitely release that information to the public so they can plan accordingly for their pre-Kers next year. We're going to make sure that we do our due diligence and thorough analysis, um, especially as this is probably going to be a two to three year implementation for our district. So we'll we'll look at a variety of things as we do, as we as we make that determination, as well as working with our again with our campus principals on that. One of the things that you know you may hear other districts that are saying we're in and we're going. There's a really good chance that the districts that are doing that had open space. That, I mean, it's literally sitting vacant. So it's like, okay, we have something to fill that vacant space. We are not in that situation. So we'll have to do a graduated to get there over time. Uh, I think JD was stayed quiet for the first meeting or two and then finally said, and where are these new full day pre-kindergartners gonna go, which was the right question to ask. Yes, so we'll, our, we'll have to have a graduated plan is really the bottom line to yes, get sir. there. And, and that's part of, it's a, it's an ongoing agenda item in our, with our facilities meeting, with our finance meeting, with our human resources meeting, um, and working with the service center again from, and uh, Ms. Goldhorn taking the lead, working with the service center on identifying, you know, what are the steps we need to take and, and it's, it's, it is going to be a significant impact on our district. 
Yeah, so one, I would use that as a segue. I just distributed Mr. Prusky's budget perimeter memo. And if you'll flip to the second page, because you, the board is can ask for these items to be addressed separately under this update 114 or continue to do that, Mr. Eisbeck. I would just say you're also, if you'll look at number 11 there, that's where Wayne, you see the HB3 implications. So what Dr. Evers was just saying about the cost and all of that, you can see these, if you look over to the right, costs are being evaluated. Here's a no less than this, no more than this. That's all the things that they're talking about. They're constantly working on trying to get those costs out. So if you don't have them on the agenda as a separate item, you're gonna get them in budget workshops. I guess that's my point, because as we learn more and more and more, these numbers will get tighter and tighter and tighter. So that's a good segue over to Mr. Prusky's budget parameter memo, if everybody's good, uh, quick update. And by the way, we, you have a workshop on February the 4th, so we don't have to do all this tonight. He's just right. giving you some information before that workshop. So this is just the, this is the January 21st version. You'll see the draft up on there and uh, with the assumptions and considerations and budget implications uh, throughout the columns. I uh, just wanted to remind, and I can do this uh, verbally without going through everything on here, but you'll see through here some of the things that we're used to seeing in previous parameter memos, the tax value growth, the M&O, we will be compressed again um, coming up, so we will have that. Some options that are there, number five, the, the board vote for one penny, uh, TRE info. Uh, but then, as Dr. Gibson was alluding to, uh, we are currently working on future staffing and staffing requests and have broken that down. So I'm at line seven and it'll go into, it'll kind of bleed over into um, row, I should say, row eight then on the second page, top of the second page. But I want to, we broke it down into four groups. You have basic services, which are the immediate needs for growth. So teachers, transportation, child nutrition, if needed. Um, you heard about that with the teacher part, with the pre-K, so that's gonna be a piece there. So we will be adding some teachers for the pre-K part. Um, other campus services is the next group, and those are per staffing guidelines. So the, like what you heard earlier, uh, the counselors, principals, assistant principals, th those natures that are staffing ratios. Uh, next one down is enhanced services. So that's if we wanna increase the number of custodians throughout the district for service ability there. Uh, GT coordinators, an example, instructional specialists, technology specialists, so those are the support parts there. Um, and then the bottom line, the bottom one is the ideal staffing. So out of all the requests that are out there, uh, to, it was approximately $6 million in staffing requests. So is that, that is when you add basic, other, enhanced, and ideal all together? That's all in, all done. Okay. So now I'm gonna go backwards. So we're projecting at today's projection, we're kind of in a range of about a million dollars. It's about $972,000 for the increased revenue that's available to the board or to the district, I should say. And then on the other end, we have about 2.2. So we have a small window there. Without that penny? That's without the penny, yes sir. Okay. So if you just take, let's just say for the sake of today, we say $2 million. Well, if we have $2 million and then you have the staffing um, situ requests or however we want to staff that, and then the question of the raise, it's a, it's a million dollars per percent. So if we have $2 million in revenue and for basic services, we kind of already know it's about $520,000. And that's row seven. And that's row seven. Okay. So now you're down to 1.5. So that's 6 million minus that five, whatever. So four and a half million or five and a half million rather is the value of other enhanced and ideal. Right. And then you'll, you'll tighten those up right. as the spring progresses so that then you know what other campus services equals and what enhanced right. equals and then what ideal equals. Exactly. Okay. And we'll have that running total. So if you have 2 million, you take off the basic services, that's a half, a, that's a half a million. So now you're at 1.5. You have the question of the raise, the question of the board vote for the if the, if we do that for the additional revenue of the 1.8, that changes that bottom line. So basically, where we sit today is in July. I mean January. And then, and then when all of that's done, the seven, eight, and nine become the decision of the board. I would say five as well. Well, okay. It, 
I agree I, on the revenue side. I have to make a decision. So I see what you're saying. So what Wayne is saying is you may have to go look down at five as you evaluate seven, eight, nine to decide how right. deep you want to go. If we're going to get raised, can we get into more than just basic services, et cetera. Okay. And Dee Dee, you had a really good question today. I like that you're always challenging us. <clears throat> um, I, I, I seriously do. I really do like that you're always challenging yeah. We Yeah, and the um, class size waiver. On ten, but the on five that Mr. Prusky just we we know all this information about bonds and TREs now we don't know the timing of when the board could do that. So anyway, with y'all with your permission, we're gonna on number five that one penny. Do you have to wait for certified values, or can the board, you know, go ahead and make a decision that we want to do it because and the the advantage or not do it, but the advantage of that is that it at least gets that revenue assumption kind of set, you know, where it's easier for Wayne to bring you a balanced sheet. It may be that they say, no, you got to wait on certified values, but we're just going to try to find out the answer to that because we, we read through HB3 again and I don't think it's in there. So we're going to have to find what someone's interpretation is, which is kind of our world right now. No, what, what were you just asking about? The, um, Number five. The board. Yeah, it's just when can the board actually oh, consider when? that? That's all I was saying. Like, could you have to wait until July? Yeah. Exactly. And what the, what brought that up is that we try to get a lot of this work done ahead of time so that you don't have to make yes. these huge decisions in July. But then we DDS said, well, what if you have to wait until July? You know, what what if the law says you have to wait? Just to add to it, we, it may fall into the line of the truth and taxation process to where that may only be available. And we're verifying this. We're, we've asked some questions today and we got a lot of questions back at us and no answers. But it may be, you may have to wait till when you're adopting the budget because that's when you do the tax rate. So the earliest you could do it is in the proposed tax rate in July for the, the discussion item. So if it worst case would be to the line up with the tax time and with the budget time would be August and if you back up to the discussion of that that would be July I think is what the truth and taxation piece could be now we don't have any formal definitive answer to that so I'm awaiting further assistance on there so as I know I can inform the board as well and so one, one of the maybe the takeaways from the February 4th is having a discussion about that one penny because and it's not a vote but just consent is like Wayne, don't even look at it, okay? Or Wayne, keep looking at it and keep bringing us information. You know, just one, he just needs to know one or the other. That's so, a good so question. Wayne, on, on the one penny for number five, uh, you know the word unanimous there? For, you know, is that a requirement? Or? Yes, by law, at that meeting, present. unanimous well, vote. By well, it's yeah, everybody, everybody that's present, present, is present at, at a meeting. duly called meeting. And so you could have four people here and it just has to be all four. So and I guess if you're going to vote no, stay home or come vote. I mean, that, it's really that's your choice. That's what the state's right. saying. And, and that's just for one penny max. I mean, there's, there's no two that's pennies, correct. three pennies. They, it's just one what, penny. Part it. of the HB3 trying to give a little additional meaningful discretion, right. i.e. courtroom, state courtroom, beyond TRE was they gave this extra penny that just said you just got to do one board vote and you can have that. And that, that gives a little more discretion. Wow. Gave a little more wiggle room on the districts don't have meaningful discretion. Wow. Okay. And, and on the enrollment, um, I don't think we've had a in-depth demographic report lately. But just it just you know, so you're looking at the numbers here, possibly anywhere from <coughs> 75 students to okay, it's coming. Okay. okay. Um, so you're looking at 75 to 100 new students coming into the uh, just driving around. That just seems impossible. But just it's well, to answer the first part, the most current demographic report will be done at the next CCAC meeting, which okay. is scheduled for February 13th, I believe. And that'll be the update. What we're getting from preliminary reports is the low growth model for this upcoming year. What you're seeing may be a bubble for future years, but for this current year coming up, I should say the next the next year, we will we're planning to follow the low growth on this. Okay, and I know, so you got down here also that Comal open enrollment. 
Um, do you know if Comal's made a decision on it yet? Because my understanding, they haven't. So that's just kind of a projection that what if? Officially, there is no, they have not. Right. It's the word out on the street. So okay. we're just following that very carefully. Okay. All right. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gibson. Thank you, Thank you Wayne, for the budget as well. I know we're going to get it in depth in a couple of weeks, so thank you. Any correspondence? I saw you, Dr. Gibson, passing that on. <laughs> yes, it was. You'll have fun. <laughs> no correspondence, Priscilla. Do you anybody else? No. Okay, report on um, board member participation, involvement in the high level rounding district, community, or government events. Mr. Westbrook? I think I went to a basketball game, Steel versus Clemens, and I think that's the summary of my actions. Thank you. I'm going to go back to uh, before the, the uh, holiday break, Christmas break, whatever you want to call it, break. Uh, I was uh, fortunate to be invited to uh, Green Valley Elementary School to uh, in a first grade classroom to uh, be in charge of the reindeer food. And if so, if you need anybody or know anybody that needs a pro in reindeer food, I'm your guy. And also uh, January 7th, uh, I attended the called board meeting uh, where we hired uh, our incoming superintendent. Um, second time for me to be involved in that process. I was expecting for it not to happen while I'm still on my, on this, my final term on this board, final term on this board. Uh, but it happened. I think it was a, it was a great process and I think we did, we did very well, you know? So anyway, that's it. Final. <clears throat> I too got to attend the January 7th board meeting, call board meeting. <clears throat> I added to my salary. I tripled my salary now. Of, uh, I'm on the appraisal district, and the pay is every bit the same as it is on this board. And we had our first board meeting on the 8th. Northeast Partnership that week as well. And then uh, Communities and Schools Financial Committee. We had a meeting last week, and then this morning we had a Communities and Schools board meeting. And the chamber luncheon today where they Maggie drug Dr. Gibson up there and presented him a plaque and thanked him and it, it was very nice and and everybody was happy that he was there that's all I have um, so I sit on two community boards the library board and the historical preservation uh, committee board uh, the library is going to be doing another book sale at the end of February. And the reason I bring it up is I know that the last time they did it, a lot of our English teachers ran over there and purchased quite a few of books for their classrooms. Um, and I'm glad to see them take advantage of that because as I work those events, that's a really great deal. You just fill a bag for five bucks and you take you know all the books you can shove in there. And the library ladies are actually very skilled at helping you to get, to, to maximize the number of books that you can get in there. Um, so that's coming up at the end of February. And I wanted to mention, too, with the Historical Preservation <coughs> Committee, um, the last time I attended, and I think it was back in November, um, we had our history club, the Clemens History Club. They attended as well, and I was glad to see them attend. Um, and I think that's a great uh, community kind of collaboration that we do with them. Um, of course, I've gone to wrestling. I know you all love hearing about that. <laughs> Um, but we do have this weekend a um, Steele and Clemens are hosting a wrestling tournament uh, in the district. It'll be at Corbett this weekend. That's all I have. Uh, attended a couple of basketball games, but uh, I guess the big event was the San Antonio area all-star football game that they had down the Alamo Dome. And uh, Coach Johnston and the Clemens football staff was, was picked to, to lead, I think, the, the black team. Coach Lana. And um, – they were losing most of the game, but they came back near the, the end there and won it. So I, I just thought it was a pretty uh, neat tribute to them. And I guess I assume they were chosen for, for having one of the best teams in the city uh, this past year, and it's certainly high profile for the coaching staff as well as some of the athletes. So that was good. I got to watch. I watched that one on TV. That was an exciting one. Um, events I've attended, I've attended a fundraiser uh, called Bar Y. Um, they raise money to buy 
livestock at um, the Guadalupe County Livestock Show. That was this past weekend. So two weeks ago, I was at Bar Y. Um, and they predominantly support all of our SCUC kids um, for them to um, have, um, for them to purchase or put money towards your animal. You have to volunteer. So it's a volunteer organization. We have our students volunteer, which is awesome. And then I attended the Guadalupe County Livestock Show last weekend and man, there were a lot of SCUC kids that showed animals, people that um, you wouldn't think, I guess, you know, some people don't think we still have a lot of rural kids, and we do. Some have them in their backyards even. And so um, we had a lot of SCUC kids there, so that was fun to watch them. Okay, do we need a board recess? Keep going? We good? All right, let's keep going. All right, so our new business is um, report and discussion items. First one is targeted improvement plan for the 2019-2020 school year for Schertz Elementary and Sipple Elementary presented by Veronica Goldhorn. For campuses that received an overall D rating in this Texas State Accountability System, campuses are required to develop a target improvement plan using the Effective Schools Framework Aligned Target Improvement Plan template which was developed by the Texas Education Agency. So attached is the targeted improvement plans for Schertz Elementary and Sippel Elementary. And uh, we will come back hopefully the next month or the month after to um, approve the targeted improvement plans for those two campuses for this school year, 2019-2020. Any questions on that? Okay. Next is discussion of Chapter 21 and non-Chapter 21 personnel contracts presented by Linda Cannon. Yes, good evening. Uh, this is a, rem a reminder that we will be taking contracts to the board um, this spring. So in February, you will see the administrators and professional contracts come through. Um, in March, you, it will be your term contracts, your teachers, librarians, nurses. And then in April, will be probationary contracts. So these will be both Chapter 21 and non-Chapter 21 contracts. Any questions? All right. Next is budget amendments presented by Wayne Prusky on dyslexia, special ed, appraisal fees. Yes, this is just a, a heads up, a, kind of a discussion through for as far as January and watching our budget. Uh, first one is for a dyslexia audit. The dollars needed for the audit are um, not in the appropriate function in function 13. So we will either be doing a transfer to function 13 or a budget amendment out of uh, fund balance to cover for the dyslexia audit cost there. And I believe that cost is, I was just told, but it's roughly about 14 to $20,000. So uh, special education contracted services, uh, dollars for function 11. Um, this is for as Positions go unfilled and contracted services are needed. The contracted services are higher than an employee. So forecasting out, we're looking to be short, possibly in uh, this area. So we may be bringing to the board a request for a budget amendment for the special ed side for that function. And again, this is just an awareness piece. And then on the appraisal fees, that one, we know we will have to come to the board that function 99, other governmental or inter intergovernmental relations, uh, we missed our estimate for appraisal fees by roughly $50,000. So we will need to add funds into that function. So as we get more information or tighter, I can bring those back. But uh, I just wanted to bring that up in this month's meeting to let the board know that these are possible and more than likely probable um, for these three. Any questions? All right, so um, for board consideration and consensus on discussion items eligible for action under our consent agenda for our future meetings. So, um, Mr. Prusky, do you think those three will be coming back for next month? Or? I believe 3A will okay. and 3C for sure. We will watch 3B. 
Okay. So three A and C for sure will come back. Okay. And those are the only three that I'll be eligible for action items for well we already discussed that the contracts that was just a heads up for each month that'll be coming back all right so our next one is our action items we're moving on to we're on page 56 for our consent items anybody want to pull anything off those consent items? i think we've already pulled we're going to pull. Are we going to pull B? Is that what you were saying? Approval of financials on this one on page 56. Yeah, that's where I am. Is that what you were saying to pull it? Or no, no, no. For next month, what okay. those amendments that so, will come back that were on discussion. Okay. Well, we don't, 3A and 3C will probably come back next month. 3B is questionable if we're going to have that on consent or a consent item next month. Madam President, I move the Board of Trustees approve the consent agenda items A through C as presented on page 56. Second. Any discussion? I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? No. All those in favor, raise your right hand. The motion passes 6 0. All right. Our next item, we're on page. 89 next is a request for board approval for SEUC 2021 school year calendar presented by Dr. Edwards. Uh, oh, no, sorry. It's the application to the Texas Education for the 2021 school year staff development waiver presented by Ms. Kovacs. Good evening. Um, as we have for the past number of years, we are planning to file the staff development waiver with TEA, which will allow us to in, um, ad, add additional staff development time during the school year that um, sort of replaces time that would have been spent uh, in the classroom with students with professional development time. So uh, our plan is to fill that out again this year and use that information as part of our school calendar recommendation. Do I... Have a motion. I move the Board of Trustees approve the staff development waiver to the Texas Education Agency for the 2020-2021 school year. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yeah, do, do y'all do any type of um, survey with the staff about um, their being out of their classroom? you know, for the staff Re development. You mean replacing the instruction days with yeah. staff development days? Uh -huh. um, I would say the DIC is the, really the <laughs> group that we would ask for that sort of um, feedback. We do have very good attendance at those mm -hmm. with from teachers from every campus and um, they are the ones who put forward that schedule. So I would say that's how we get that feedback. Mr. Pipito, I can add to that, um, which was actually part of the feedback for the next item, but it, it, it embraces that. Um, one of the comments <clears throat> was that we appreciate the full day PLC PD day versus the half days in the past. So overwhelmingly, when we started talking about the school calendar, the having those days were one of the top um, uh, themes or patterns. Uh, amongst the DIC, which two-thirds of that is teachers, uh, of course. And so, um, yes, there's typically positive feedback about having those days, both for the PD component of that, as well as how now we have um, joined those two together with the, with the PD slash PLC days, and it really gets us to the learning by doing and being able to apply some of those things and work not only the learning part, but then to be able to take that back to your PLCs and have those discussions. So, yes, sir, that, there was positive feedback. Okay, I just, that. you know... I you know, with having the report tonight where the test scores are, are flat or under what they have been, and I'm not a big test score person, but it's out there. People look at it. Uh, and the, the cost effectiveness in, this, in the teacher's time of being in a workshop, you know, where it may help them do a better job right. with that or being in the classroom working on that. So, I, you know, that's, that's the, the angst of it, I guess, for me is, that, you know, you know, which, which is, which is better. And I can tell you um, a lot of the conversation when, as we're moving forward with those uh, K through three reading academies, those staff days are going to be 
instrumental oh, I, I, in, yeah, in that part I, of the you, process. You won't have enough time to do all those. Correct. Things, yes, sir. So I understand that. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other comments or questions? All those in favor, raise your right hand. All those opposed, motion passes 6-0. Now we have a request for board approval um, for our SEUC 2021 school year calendar presented by Dr. Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Rasbeck. Um, as part of the process each year, we use our district improvement committee to uh, look at our school calendar. Uh, we start off with looking at our current calendar, other calendars in the area to formulate and start developing drafts um, as that, that's a process that begins in um, uh, really in September, October with, uh, again, what do we like about our current calendar and what else is out there. Uh, we follow that process and bring a recommendation to the board based upon the DIC's uh, vote, if you will, and it is, we emphasize that it's a recommendation. Um, the district may not, as a, as a reminder, the district may not begin instruction prior to the fourth Monday in August unless the district is a district of innovation, which we are. That gives us that flexibility. The school calendar it allows us as a district to establish days of operations and contract days for employees, including uh, any time required for staff development, planning and, and preparation, and continuing education. Um, as we went through the process, uh, you have three documents in there. Um, we went through the process and gathered uh, considerations. Uh, this was shared with all the DIC members uh, several different times, but certainly as we concluded, um, with, uh, with that being said, draft option B was selected by about 83% uh, amongst the DIC vote. Um, just real quick, some of the feedback related to uh, the calendar itself. Um, it's great. Love the days, how the days are organized. Uh, the process was very thorough, and option B seems to be the best option for all students and teachers. Um, as a parent, I prefer the earlier release for summer. Um, uh, we appreciate the PLC PD days that we just referenced, Mr. Pivoteau, uh, and thanks for developing a strong calendar for our district families will flock to SCUC. And so those, those are just a couple of the, or several of the comments that we asked for, uh, just for feedback as it related to um, why they chose that particular calendar that they chose. And so with that being said, uh, the committee's recommendation uh, that we're asking for approval on is draft B um, in your board book. Madam President, I move the Board of Trustees support or approve the 2019-2020 school year calendar as recommended by the District Improvement Committee, option B. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? And only discussion I was going to say is I know people are going to say when is graduation and because that's not on the calendar and they always ask that after it comes out but we will not know that yet for a while correct Dr. Edwards? Um, it will we, we won't typically um, after we got past that first uh, district of innovation year or that early year right. it'll typically be that last week of school because now the other mm -hmm. districts that we're in a partnership with uh, for Freeman are also part of that and so that are typically, we, we, we've been able to hold on that uh, on that week, that final week of school. It just won't be on there when it comes out right now. So I know people no, want to know No, this is just that. a draft. <laughs> yes. we'll, we are, we uh, have preparations to do the final sure. uh, pretty version, if the you will. The pretty version, um, yes. And get that out just as soon as possible. Okay, so I have um, any more discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. All those opposed, motion passes 6-0. Next on our action items is request for board approval, budget amendment number three for the following, presented by Mr. Prusky, which is 45,000 in professional development in accordance with the bilingual exception wa waiver and 50,000 for the first of five payments toward the Miracle Field constructed by the city of Cibola YMCA. And we've done this before and this is really wonky, but you, before the trustees can even consider an item for approval, they have to have approved funds. It, we've checked it and double checked it and triple checked it. That's what the attorneys say. So my point with that, Wayne, if item number four comes into the discussion, then Dr. Edwards and Mr. <coughs> Bear just be ready and let's go ahead and talk about it. Okay. If that's all right with yes. you, because if they roll together, 3B and item four roll together. Yes. Uh, but they have to be voted um, separately. Yeah. yeah, I just want to make a note that um, uh, I've been on the YMCA Board of Advisors Quite a while, so I'm going to participate in the discussion, but I'm going to recuse mm -hmm. myself from any vote or abstain from a vote on those. Okay, okay? thank you, Mr. Yeah. 
President Dreisbach, uh, the board is asked to consider this budget amendment to where $95,000 will come from the general fund fund balance, general operating fund balance uh, for two functions. Um, the bottom line up front has an error in there or, or an omission, I should say. The $45,000 for professional development would come would go into function 13 and the 50,000 payment, $50,000 payment, the first of five payments would go into function 81. I believe that's the right one. Yes, uh, we'd be in function 81. So we're splitting it into two different functions. That's the only change on that sheet. So I apologize for that omission there. Um, as background, uh, you can see for school districts, I think we, like we discussed on the bilingual exception waiver in cases where we have uh, no, insufficient number of appropriately certified staff. So this will help with the develop, professional development plan targeting the competencies needed to serve uh, these um, learners. And then the miracle field and the inclusion playground is with the agreement with the YMCA uh, to support the children of all abilities and uh, SCUC access. I'll stop there. Wayne, do you need the motion modified to include those functions or just the minutes to note that? The minutes will have the. Okay. Sorry. The minutes will have there. That's why I wanted to put it, I wanted to say it as well. But Budget Amendment 3 will come out of general operating and will be split into function 13 and function 81. 45,000, function 13, 50,000, yes, function. And if it wants to be worded that way, it would be cleaner. I'd appreciate it, but it's up to. Okay. We can make the minutes say now that you've said it twice and I've repeated it twice. We can okay. make the minutes say that that's it, what the it's in the exhibit behind the action sheet. It's just not worded on the action right. sheet. Okay. Yeah. Let, me, let me ask you, Wayne, on the on the fifty thousand dollars to the the YMCA. Can, can this board bind future boards, or does it have to come back to the each successive board on an annual basis to approve an additional fifty thousand dollars? Well, that's the next. Just, it's, well, no, we, can, hey. we can, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because that's, no, we can discuss both of them mm -hmm. because that kind of goes into what we're doing now. So our uh, number four action items request for board approval, the partnership agreement between the YMCA and the Shirt Civil Universal City Independent School District, the Miracle League Field and Inclusion Playground Project presented by Dr. Edwards and Mr. Rivera. And it does have that discussion, what Mr. Inman is discussing on that yes ma'am if i may uh we are in the process of actually getting very close to finalizing the final draft agreement for dr gibson and uh for the board uh it has a um a multi-year funding out clause so that there the amount that the board is uh, allowing us to use at up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars fifty thousand dollars each year uh our uh, is subject to the availability of those funds. If some something horrible happened and we decided we couldn't do that anymore, we would not be held liable because of that multi-year funding out clause. So boards can uh, obligate multiple years, but only if they have that provision to protect the board in case of some unforeseen condition to prevent them having the funding available. Okay. Do I have a motion? Then we can discuss if we need to further. Madam President, I move the Board of Trustees approve a budget amendment number three in the amount of $95,000 is presented with $45,000 being moved to function 13 and $50,000 being moved to function 81. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Discussion? Mm -hmm. On this? Anyone have discussion? No, I will, I will say I think the funding of the Miracle Field is consistent with our mission, vision, and values for this district. And, and so I think it'll be positive. Any other discussion? All right. All those in favor, raise your right hand. All those opposed, motion passes 5-0. No, with I know abstain. it's weird uh, and think that was clear the abstention, and that's good. The, and we don't need to replay number four unless Dr. Edwards or Ms. Rivera, you have anything else since we kind of went into it. Nope, we're ready to vote. But it is a separate action mm, action. item. Yeah. Absolutely. Madam President, I move the Board of Trustees approve a participation and use agreement with the YMCA for the Miracle League field and inclusion playground project and, and authorize the superintendent to negotiate the final form of agreement 
and to execute the agreement on behalf of the district for a total not to exceed the amount of $250,000 payable over a five-year period. I second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I do agree with um, Mr. Westbrook that this does line up with our mission, vision, and value, and our goals, and um, we're excited to be able to participate in that if this motion passes. All those in favor, raise your right hand. All those opposed, uh, motion passes 5-0 with one abstaining. So Freddie, you can go home now if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> He's lasted it out, but thank you. Oh, you're here for the HVAC. Okay, sorry, <laughs> Mr. Emmett, yeah. We appreciate all the work and look yes. forward to continued partnership. Next on our agenda, we have a request for board approval RFP number 20-003S English Language Arts Reading Phonics Program for grades, grades K through 3 presented by Kelly Kovacs and Matt Rivera. Page 116. So this evening we're bringing to you for board approval the selections uh, from the RFP process for phonics for grades K through 3 and grades 4 through 5. If you'll remember when we brought this item in October, um, we had attempted to make this purchase last spring and realized that it needed to be broken up into K through three and four and five separate from K through five. So those RFPs selection committees have met and made their determinations. And so we'd like to request your approval for those this evening. Those will be paid for out of IMA since phonics is a part of our required TEKS for English language arts and reading. Do I have a motion? Anybody got it pulled up? I move the Board of Trustees approve the proposal on unit pricing for the English language arts reading phonics program for grades K through three from really great reading as per solicitation 20-0036. Yes. Or three S, sorry. I second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Ms. Kovacs, that's out of the IMA from last, well, we can use our IMA famous, but that was under the adoption from last year. All right. All those in favor, raise your right hand. All those opposed, motion passes 6-0. Next, we have a request for board approval, RFP number 20-004S, English Language Arts Reading Phonics Program for grades 4 and 5, presented by Kelly Kovacs and Matt Rivera. Same. <laughs> Ditto. Ditto. Well, and I'll just remind the trustees that you all had asked, just in case there are any questions or had arisen to not put it on consent agenda, but nothing has changed from our perspective okay. since last month. Do I have a motion? I move the Board of Trustees approve the proposal and unit pricing for the English Language Arts Reading Phonics Program for grades four through five from Frenchmark Education Company, LLC, as per solicitation 20-004S. I second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? I have one question or comment. So in her presentation earlier from the taper report, uh, fourth and fifth grade reading had leveled off or decreasing. I think that's, was it fourth and fifth grade? And so what reading programs were we using in the past? Or is this the same one? So for phonics, um, we didn't have one program for the district. Each campus over time had purchased their own program or were using those that had been developed in the curriculum guides. So this is now allowing us to have one program that we can support across the district. So it varied to answer your question. Okay. Thank you. Any more discussion? Any more questions? All those in favor, raise your right hand. All those opposed, motion passes 6-0. Next, we have a request for board approval, solicitation for technology, data consulting services, RFQ number 20-009V, presented by Dr. Burkholder and Matt Rivera. Yes, thank you, Madam President. Tonight, we are bringing to you the name of six firms capable of providing technology consulting services on uh, any future technology projects, um, because we have so many different areas in technology that uh, require special 
specialization, it, it's good to have some firms that have expertise in various areas. These, this is, there's no current budget impact. We will determine when um, we would need their services for any future projects. A motion. One twenty-two. I got it. I move the board of trustees approve the recommended firms to approve technology data consulting services as per solicitation twenty zero zero nine V as presented. I second. Any discussion? So it's mainly for right now, just for those if needed services. Okay. Can we have someone figure out these iPad things that, you know? <laughs> the iPad whisper We seem to be locking up a lot to tonight. take a different path every time I have to open this thing for whatever. We'll see what we can do. It may be user error. That may not be the system. No, all five of us. I'm willing to admit it. All six it of us are struggling tonight. <laughs> uh, all right. Any more discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. All those opposed, motion passes 6-0. Next, we have a request for board approval, RFCSP number 20-013C, provide and install fencing, five locations presented by Mr. Mosley and Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Madam President, uh, Dr. Gibson, members of the board. Um, so this first item here is the uh, award of our fencing project. It was an EPP project that was discussed uh, back in the fall. Uh, we're basically putting in chain link fence to go up against existing residential fence that in many many cases is kind of falling down. So it's just uh, an effort to secure our campuses. So it's multiple campuses? Yes, sir. We're looking at Pascal, Green Valley, Jordan, Wilder, and Dobie. Thank you. Yes, sir. Madam President, I move the Board of Trustees approve the proposal for um, the anchor group in the amount of $70,553 for the provide, no, <laughs> to provide and install fencing at five location project as per solicitation 20-013C. I second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Just a quick question. Are these replacements or are they new fencing? No, this is new fencing. So the this fencing that is there now is residential wooden fence. Oh, that's right. Yes, that's right. Okay. So there's it. a lot of these fences actually have gates on our property from and their so houses. Those, yes, sir. Well, a lot of the wooden fencing now is coming down. Yeah, a lot, a lot of 15, 20 year old houses yes. now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sir. Any other? All those in favor, raise your right hand. All those opposed, motion passes 6 0. Last one, request for board approval, solicitation for HVAC renovation, replacement, and multiple sites, RF CSP number 20-014C, presented by Mr. Mosley and Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, this is the uh, action item to award our next uh, in-line HVAC projects. Uh, we are replacing Green Valley Elementary in whole. Uh, half of this building that we did not do last time, and then as well as the kitchen for Clemens High School. Um, uh, one note I do want to make on this is that it says on here 2013 bond savings. This is actually 2016 bond savings. Okay. So uh, we'll, we'll need to make, make that adjustment in the motion as well. Um, and so we are approving uh, marksman uh, general contractors tonight. Madam President, I move the Board of Trustees approve the proposed submit, submitted by Marksman General Contractors as per solicitation 20-014C for the not to exceed amount of 4700000 and acknowledge that the funds are provided under the 2016 bond savings. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. All those opposed, motion passes 6-0. Those campuses will be happy to get some, probably some new air, updated air conditioning. And y'all figured out a way to do this in without having to pay for it, right? Yeah. Yeah. As we said, it was going to be this one. I'm like, really? As long as you don't mess with playground time. 
All right, we're going to go into closed session. The board will now adjourn, adjourn into closed session pursuant to the following sections of the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Section 551. 0.072 authorization to deliberate the purchase exchange lease or value of a real property if deliberation and open meeting would have a detrimental effect on the position of the governmental body in negotiations with a third person. In Texas Government Code Section 551.074, authorization to deliberate the appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment, duties, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer or employee or to hear a complaint or charge against an officer or employee. The time is 8.02.
We're back in session at 824. Next item on the agenda is request for board action of employment of contractual personnel presented by Linda Cannon. Yes, the positions on the employment list as presented in closed session are replacing positions for the 1920 school year and will be funded from the general operating budget. Madam President, I move the Board of Trustees approve the appointment list as presented of contractual personnel for the 2019 and 2020 school year. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor, raise your right hand. All those opposed? Motion passes 6-0. Next item on the agenda is review and discussion for our planning calendar and request for future action items. Um, all of it? Whatever you okay. want to share. Okay. <laughs> so, your call. You share. I'm going to get this down. All right. So uh, we have a called board workshop on Tuesday, February 4th. We have a regular board meeting on February 18th. Um, on the 12th of February, we have uh, a welcome reception for Dr. Ely, and on the 4th of March, we have a retirement reception for Dr. Gibson. Um, I don't know what the rest of that is. Just a reminder, on February 13th, the CCAC. Yes. yes. So the, I have down Pivoto, Finley, and Seaver. Is yeah. that correct? Yes, Pivoto, Finley, and Seaver, and it will be live streamed for the rest of the four of us to view live. And anyone else, and anyone else that wants to view it. We just can't all be here. Okay, and I have from January 31st through February 5th that uh, Mr. Perkins is attending the NSBA conference in Washington. Mm -hmm. um, the Texas Tri-County Chamber Luncheon is on February the 11th. The Northeast Partnership Chamber Luncheon is February 13th. The Chamber in Shirts Luncheon is February 18th. Uh, the Mexican Asso American School Board Association Annual Conference is February 20th through the 22nd. TASB Governance Camp in Galveston. Uh, I have Inman and Westbrook attending February 26th through the 29th. Uh, TASB Grassroots for Region 20, Thursday, February 20th. And then the CIS Rock and Roll for Kids rolls out in February. And I believe this year, Jerry, you wanna tell us a little bit about that? They're doing it different. This year, instead of doing one event, we're going out to each of the districts and, and trying to get them interested and bring ba bands together to play in a competition. And then there'll be a, f a final competition at the Green Hall later in the year where those bands that win the separate competitions will come up and compete. And that will be very similar to the Rock and Roll for Kids that we've seen in the past. But each one of these will be an opportunity to get more involvement and to, to uh, touch those kids and really actually hear rock and roll at uh, Rock and Roll for Kids. <laughs> I would also add um, Leadership Corps is on February the 11th. Yes. And I think you and or Mr. Perkins are going to here. kick that off for them. And Dr. Ely's going to be here mm -hmm. as part of that. And I'll, I'll just add for the, the MOSBA conference, that's actually free. For all trustees, the one to attend since we're a member of that, and it's going to be here in San Antonio. So it's their 50th anniversary, so that should be a big deal for them. Yep, and I think I know we acknowledge that, uh, Gary. Uh, well, I was planning on going, I think Gary and I were planning on going to Mazba also. Yeah, I don't know. I know, according to board policy, I don't know if that needed to be voted on because I know if whenever we're traveling, we're, we're sort of required to sort of ask the board for permission. You may be thinking about Galveston. Just well, Galveston, but yeah. Mosby's Mos Mos here in town. It's free, so it's not a no. That's yeah, that's big deal, true. So maybe Galveston. Uh, the other thing was like the sorry. Go ahead. Was grassroots? <laughs> that's why I just said it was grassroots on there. It is on there. It's on the twentieth. It's on the twentieth. I believe it's Thursday. Okay, that's February twentieth. So you have three different events going on the twentieth through twenty-third. Obviously, grassroots is on the twentieth. It's at the bottom. It's zero. okay. You have Mazba 20 through 23rd. You have something else, the 20th through 23rd. Um, Mazba is 20, 20th through the 22nd. Uh, the Good Governance Camp in Galveston is 26th through the 29th. Yep. And Grassroots is on February the 20th. 
And, and as far as the MASBO fees, it is it is free for board members with our membership. Um, but if you if we register you and you do not attend, for whatever reason, we will be charged the entire registration fee, oh, which is, yeah. I think, $395. Wow. I think there's one more. I'm not sure. I don't... It's going to be difficult for me not to attend, but there's also the Texas Association, Texas Association of Black School Educators. That's also in San Antonio. So on the 20th through 23rd, there's like three different events. It's, it's mad busy. crazy. It's going to be super busy, but a lot to learn. Jerry, I was going to say I could get my boys up from Galveston, you know, get the old band together, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> like. oh my God. The old boys. Oh, please, Dave. Please. Everybody else might as well not show up. That's all I'm saying. A little bit like the Rolling Stones or something? Uh, no, no, no. There's okay. like more like more like, you know, the doors or, you know, somebody like that. All right, Anders. Dr. Gibson. 830. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I will not be available for the February 18th board meeting. Sorry. <laughs> okay. I will be missing a board meeting, which never happens, but I will miss one February 18th. Sorry. Okay, Thank you. Dave. All right. 8.30. We're going to adjourn your last board <laughs> meeting. Do you want anything ceremonial? <laughs> no, I think you're welcome. To take yeah. <laughs> All right. We're adjourned. We adjourn. So moved at 8.30.